Okay, so finally, Jameson Lop. Kudos to all of you brave souls who are still here in Meet Space with us. Uh, hello to everyone out there in the digital realm on the live stream, and a special welcome to those of you currently in virtual reality. I'll be meeting up with you shortly after. My name is Jameson Lopp. I am the co-founder and CTO of CASA, and I have been doing Bitcoin security uh, wallet infrastructure for about five years now full time. It's not particularly glamorous work. It's not cutting edge stuff. I, I generally tend to steer clear of most of the really cool stuff that you've seen throughout this conference. And that's really what this uh, presentation is about. It's the, the promises that we're seeing in all of these new uh, complex features and functions that are being developed uh, for Bitcoin and other crypto protocols, and then the balance that we uh, as application developers have to worry about with regard to usability and security. So we'll start somewhat near the beginning. I'm trying not to make too many assumptions about your level of understanding of Bitcoin, but. As many of us probably know, there is no such thing as a Bitcoin. There are just transaction outputs. And those outputs can be either spent or unspent. And the way that we control the spending or spendability of these outputs is with uh, scripts. And Bitcoin has a scripting language. It's fairly limited. It's uh, not quite as easy to work with as, as some more full-featured languages uh, like you see on other networks like Ethereum, but it generally gets the job done. And for most interactions on the Bitcoin network, you're using fairly simple scripts that just say, uh, I need to have one single signature in order to redeem this output. And without going too deeply into it, uh, this is basically how the operation of a single signature script works. You've got a signature, uh, a pub key, and you're essentially performing operations that eventually result in you actually doing a check of the uh, signature against the hash of the pub key that actually gets placed on the blockchain when you're creating that UTXO. Now, uh, this isn't a great diagram, but just to show you, it gets a little more complex when we start doing multiple signature outputs. Essentially, we have more data that's going into these scripts that's saying, I need M out of N different signatures, and then we are verifying by seeing, you know, do we have the correct threshold of signatures in the redeem script uh, at the point in time when someone tries to actually spin that output. So if, if we're actually looking at how these... Uh, Scripts are set up, you can see that a single signature script is fairly simple and straightforward. A multi-sig script, about the same, but you know, then you have uh, up to n number of pub keys. But it doesn't stop there. You can actually have a, a wide variety of different conditionals and you can start creating much more complex scripts. Uh, but a simple next step, for example, from a multi-sig escrow type of script would be some sort of escape hatch. Basically saying, I'm going to put my money into an escrow between three people, and if for some reason they can't come to an agreement to spend from it, then after a certain amount of time, the original owner of that money can just have a single signature to get their money back. And uh, throughout some of these slides, I'm putting what I believe are some of the more important uh, opcodes in green and some of the uh, potentially dangerous opcodes in red, which we'll get into later. Uh, so one interesting thing that has been theorized, I'm not aware of this actually being used yet, but for example, in mixing operations, uh, there's Often an issue when you're creating a completely decentralized, like trustless uh, mixing markets where a surveiller could come in essentially acting like a whale and try to mix with everyone else who is trying to Im improve their privacy on the network. And so this is the similar type of problem that you actually run into with like Bitcoin and creating blocks. It's 
Uh, if there's no cost to doing the operation, or they're very low cost to doing the operation, then uh, you can be subject to Sybil attacks and other malfeasance. So one thing that has been theorized is, well, uh, someone who is trying to act as a market maker could essentially say, hey, I've also set aside a lot of other Bitcoins that I'm provably locking up for a long period of time just to show you that I'm really dedicated to this. You know, I've, I've put a provable high cost onto it. And so that might be a way for you to gain a bit more trust that uh, your counterparty is not just uh, trying to uh, de-anonymize everyone in the uh, mixing software. Now, this is actually from Arwen, uh, one of the Interesting things that we also start to get into is when we chain lots of transactions together. Uh, you'll mainly see things like escrow, uh, multi-sig, and then various time-locking operations go on. So, you know, just a few presentations ago, we actually had uh, an in-depth discussion of how Arwen works, how it allows you to create a protocol where two people can have an atomic swap that they are both confident they uh, they won't get. Uh, uh, their funds stolen by the counterparty. Now, uh, I don't think it's obvious uh, from this particular diagram, but there are multiple time locking operations uh, that are going into this. And uh, also, you're, you're getting some puzzle data with some hashes and pre-image uh, that are going on. So we're putting in some other data that is just sort of come up with on the fly at the time that we're engaging in this operation. It gets even more complex. This was actually from Jeremy Rubin on utxos.org, where we can create incredibly complex uh, control flows of value via a variety of different UTXOs that have different levels of security, single SIG versus multi SIG. Uh, we may even have pre signed transactions that only go to certain well known whitelisted addresses in deep storage, cold storage. And essentially, you know, the point that we're getting to here is you're only really limited by your creativity when it comes to the, the constructions that, that you can create, even from this very, very limited scripting language. We won't even try to delve into HTLCs, if you can even read any of that. But, you know, this is the fundamental underpinning of Lightning Network. It is creating a fairly complex game theory via a number of time-locked transactions and various escape hatches that allow people to assure themselves that if the counterparty tries to cheat them, that they can actually uh, have the final say and get all of their money back. And I think uh, someone said it earlier in the conference, but uh, it may have just been a side conversation, but essentially, one way to look at you know, public blockchain networks is that what we're trying to do is to guarantee that cheaters never win. So while I was creating this presentation, Jimmy Song actually uh, put out a question of like, why can't I just get a multi-sig time lock wallet that works with hardware? And apologies to Jimmy for my snarky and not very insightful reply, because I didn't want to spill the beans on anything. But this is, in fact, something that I have wanted to do for a long time. But we'll go into some details as to why I ended up deciding against implementing it, at least uh, with the current tools that are available. So we talked a little bit about multi-sig. Fairly straightforward from a scripting standpoint. Uh, so what happens if you want to have an additional time lock on your multi-sig funds? Well, you just have the same script, and then you throw in an additional time locking operation into that script. And uh, with check block time verify, I think you can either put in a block height or um, you can put in a, a timestamp. Basically, the number gets interpreted uh, in different ways depending on the range of the, the value you put in there. And this is the type of thing that I would like to see. There's a couple different ways you could do it, where essentially you, you start off with your regular uh, best case threshold, say three out of five, and then you have some conditionals that basically say, well, okay, if for some reason these funds don't get spent for some long time period, say a year, then we can turn that 
uh, from a three out of five to maybe a two out of five. You know, maybe you lost some keys, maybe something went wrong, and for, you don't have that threshold anymore. And then maybe at the extreme case, after several years, we say, okay, we're actually gonna make it a single SIG operation because something has obviously gone terribly wrong and we can't uh, successfully get to the threshold of keys that we need to spend from our wallet. Uh, you could also go the other way where you, know, you start out at, at a threshold and then you just add more pub keys. So you could turn it into a three out of six or three out of seven and basically have more redundant keys you know, geographically uh, dispersed around the world. And um, I don't know uh, if there's any particular appreciable difference between these two things. I mean, the, the script, total script size on the first one would be a little bit smaller. Maybe uh, you could discuss some game theory implications around them, but you get essentially the, the same uh, level of degradation. And as you can see, these scripts start to become really complex. One of the reasons I didn't like the idea of implementing them was because it would, it would use a lot more data on the blockchain. It would make every single transaction in that wallet a lot more expensive. Um, also, there's privacy implications. It would be a fairly unique uh, script. And uh, the nice thing, though, is that hopefully before too long, we'll have a solution for some of those privacy and scalability issues, and we'll be able to have much more complex scripts and, and logical branches of scripts that are essentially hidden through Taproot. Now, that solves a lot of the scalability and privacy problems, but it doesn't solve uh, one final problem that I'm still gonna go into now. And that is essentially uh, disaster recovery for a wallet. What happens if you know, all of the hardware and software that you are using on a regular basis to run your wallet uh, disappears? You know, you say you have some sort of catastrophic loss uh, due to any number of different reasons. How do you reconstitute that wallet from initial data? And usually this means you go, you get your 24 word seed, you load it into some common wallet software, and it just magically finds all your Bitcoins. Well, unfortunately, in reality, it tends not to work that well. And this is, in fact, why we now have a repository uh, that you can check out on walletsrecovery.org. This is run by Rodolfo Novak and Janine because they were running into this issue all the time. The problem is that we have many different standards, and even though a lot of wallets will follow one of those standards, many wallets don't follow any standard at all. And uh, the, the even worse part is that in many cases they don't very well document what they have done. And so you get into a lot of cases where a user may have had a catastrophic loss, they have their recovery uh, seed phrase, and then they start plugging it into other software and they have no Bitcoin. And the reason for that is, is actually due to the way that Bitcoin wallets you know, discover addresses. If you're familiar with BIP32, this is, uh, to my knowledge, pretty much every wallet out there does follow BIP32. Uh, but even if it follows a lot of the, the standard paths that uh, are generally expected and will be searched by wallet software when it's initializing a new wallet, uh, one of the, the final points that I, I want to get to is that it's not as simple as you might see here where, oh, you just get to the end of all of your derivation paths and then poof, you've got an address. The problem is that that is true for a simple single SIG address, but once you start creating arbitrarily complex scripts, you know, the, the entire script itself is actually going to become uh, a part of this address. And, you know, there's different address formats out there. Um, and, you know, the addresses themselves are, are more for humans uh, than for the software. But the, the point being, in order to find, you know, where your funds may be, you have to have some idea of, like, what that script actually looks like. So we saw the HTLCs and, and how complex they are and that, you know, in fact, most of the things on this screen never even get broadcast to the blockchain. They're just privately sent back and forth between different uh, nodes on the network. And if you've ever gone and tried to do a disaster recovery on a Lightning wallet, uh, which I've unfortunately had to do a number of times, both for myself and other people, um, a lot of people 
who were you know, longtime Bitcoiners, you know, they had their, their seed phrase, and so they felt like they were safe. But then they loaded it up into the wallet software and let it scan the blockchain, and then they discovered that uh, not all of their funds were actually there. This is because the, the seed phrase is only able to discover the funds that are on chain in the addresses that are managed by that single sig wallet. The funds that are actually in channels that are you know, being uh, sent to outputs that are in these HTLCs that aren't broadcast to the blockchain, they are created with more complex scripts that, that have time locks and have uh, new values uh, for the UTXOs that uh, no, nobody knows about other than those two people. So the only way to really ensure a 100% recovery of your funds, both on-chain and off-chain with Lightning, is to back up every single HTLC, you know, every single transaction, even the ones that you're not broadcasting out onto the network. And that's why we have the concept of watchtowers, the, the idea that we will have uh, redundant backups and in fact incentivize other parties to be looking out uh, for anyone who's trying to cheat us and uh, would also be able to help us recover if for some reason we lost that data. So what do we want to do if, if we want to leverage all of these awesome new features but we don't want to get into a situation where uh, users are not able to have a disaster recovery very easily? The easy thing is just to you know, use sane scripts that are very predictable so that you can have a, a very simple guide or a template. Um, but you know, if you need to put arbitrary data, which is usually gonna be like time locks or something like that, um, into these uh, transactions, then you need to have a, a guide uh, whether that is your own like special recovery software or your own mechanism for backing up the data, it's, it's really gonna be up to you. And you know, I think this is one of the things where over time, we're gonna discover what the best ways to do this are and perhaps we'll get some standards, um, perhaps not. But um, you know, there are at least some ways that uh, we are able to describe scripts well. Um, I don't know a lot about uh, descriptors which have been worked on and have been added to core. I'm not sure how well uh, we can perhaps extend those and have uh, templates that make it more obvious of like how we might be putting arbitrary data into these scripts. But um, I think the most important thing that there's really no excuse for any wallet not to do is to have a, a well documented and tested uh, recovery process. And so if there are any wallets that are not documented on walletsrecovery.org, I think that's the absolute minimum that we should be expecting from them. And what I really want us uh, to get to the point that we can do recoveries as well as Electrum does right now for multi-sig, um, the optimal way I think that we should be able to allow someone to completely recover a wallet from nothing but their like original seed data is via a GUI that is essentially creating a wizard that anyone can just click through a few different options that, that should be very well documented or obvious to them if they understand how their wallet works so that under the hood, the wallet can then uh, generate all of those scripts and do the address derivation, do the discovery of UTXOs, and then uh, allow you to once again spin them. So it's, uh, it's not a particularly fun topic to talk about, but you know, losing money is a lot less fun, I think, than uh, putting in a lot of good work ahead of time. So this is one of the things that is always uh, in the back of my mind, I think whenever someone who is building software in this space is looking towards leveraging amazing new functionality, they also need to think about you know, how do I ensure that I'm not creating a foot gun where users who are excited about using this functionality end up losing money because of some edge case disaster scenario. Questions?
Hello. Uh, so one of the things I've thought about just a little bit, and I'm wondering if you've thought about it more, is uh, giving users a unique seed if they set up a multi-sig, and then encoding all your derivation requirements into the seed. So instead of 12 words, maybe you have 14. Yeah. Um, I think the, so the AEZ, for example, um, is like one step in a similar direction. I think the AEZ only really encodes, encodes the birth date uh, of the wallet, but having other standards, uh, you know, we have to have the data somewhere. Uh, it, it does seem like it would make more sense to just encode it all in one big package. Uh, then, of course, we get to have a lot of arguments about another standard uh, for all of this. But that is ultimately what I would like to see is you, know, you just have one data blob and you, you tell the user this is an, the important data blob, you know, store it in as many redundant locations as possible, and then the, the optimal thing is they can just load that into standard wallet software and click a button and it works. But yeah, I would love to see that. The only, the only problem, of course, is like backwards compatibility and uh, I know that even like in some of my own experience of working on wallets that were very long lived and as things develop, as standards change, you actually, you can have one wallet that started out you know, as like a legacy wallet and then you don't wanna change all the seeds around so you start just adding a bunch of other derivation paths for like SegWit or whatever. Uh, it can get a little nasty over the long term. Thank you. Oh, for, further on that, if I can. Um, I think, at least if you think about the slightly more advanced cases than just single user, single key situations, uh, you probably want to separate the actual key material, the seed or private key, from the information on derivation on a wallet. Uh, one particular reason is I might have one hardware wallet, which I want to have the seed backed up somewhere, but simultaneously, I want to participate with that device in some multi-sig setup. Uh, you, you, if you want to use that device for multiple things, you don't want every backup for every application to include the private key material. Uh, this is a complication to users because you, you now have two levels of things, but one is like the actual secret thing, and the other is if you leak it, it's just a privacy issue, which you can you know, back up on anywhere. Uh, and I hope work around descriptor wallets and Miniscript will help with that. But. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, uh, that's, so what we're doing at Casa right now is, um, you know, our users keep most of their keys on, on hardware devices and, you know, Casa never even knows anything about those. And so we just generate a, a, a guide that's personalized for each wallet that says, you know, this is all the pub, pub key and derivation path data. But unfortunately, it's still probably more, more complicated than we would like it to see because I, I have to go through and write like a three-page document that says, click this in Electrum and then click that in Electrum. Um, it's, it's doable, but we can definitely improve upon it. Uh, so thanks for, uh, for you know, helping to build these things so people can actually keep uh, their keys safe. Um, so you mentioned that all these different wallets have created their own different standards for HD. Uh, do you know if there's any particular reason why they might have done that or if anyone could be better than anyone other or if anyone has said like this is definitely the standard that they should all move to in the future? Uh, well, I mean, I think part of it is just the nature of the freedom of the protocol that, you know, we can say this is the best practice but uh, developers may not be familiar with the standards. I mean, there are a lot of BIPs out there. Uh, you know, very few people even know all of the BIPs, uh, and they may just start developing without uh, reading everything. But um, there, there can also be issues, I guess, with some confusion, um, especially when, when you start getting down into some of the like different address formats and then what the like recommendations are uh, between things like uh, different formats of extended public keys uh, versus uh, different derivation paths versus SegWit versus non-SegWit. It can actually get kind of confusing. So part, I think, of the problem is that you, know, you can make almost anything work. Like the protocol 
generally doesn't care you know, how you're deriving stuff. And so it's very easy to, to create a non-standard wallet and nobody really even knows what you've done until they try to load it into some other software and all of a sudden nothing works. So you know, th there is no like, great overseeing maintainer of the entire ecosystem. Uh, so it's not, I think, until people like Rodolfo uh, come together and start actually centralizing you know, a single source of information of like, how different all of these things are that it's not even obvious uh, to a lot of us. But yeah, this is like, um, I think you really would have to go and, and ask you know, each of these teams of developers like why you chose a certain thing. And you know, f for us, for, for example, like we had to make uh, some decisions around the fact that uh, we don't have, um, well, we only have one out of N uh, private keys you know, for the wallets that we're creating for users. And uh, we actually went in, into, from my understanding, a non-standard path in the sense that uh, we actually have this uh, concept of device and key rotation built into our wallets. And, um, and so that actually results in us like incrementing the, uh, the derivation pass, I think, at a rate that you generally don't see happen in most wallets. And that can also result in the derivation paths between some of the different devices actually being different. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty weird. <laughs> but um, you know, that's, we were creating a situation that I don't think like, any other wallet provider out there had tried to do before.